Hey everybody and welcome to a very special brand new Nintendo News Report for Tuesday, July 14th, 2015, directly to you. Uh, unfortunately not in the good way this week because there was only one news story in the past seven days and it was not a good one. Um, I, I don't mean no other news this week in the sense that this story was so big that it overshadowed every other one and it, it certainly did. But because of the news that happened this week, regardless of what else happened, this would be the only story we could talk about because it was just so big. So we decided to devote an entire episode to the life of the great, late Mr. President Satoru Iwata. Today I am joined by Donald Terrio of Nintendo News Report. I have written so many great news stories in the last month and then I have to write about the passing of the president, that kind of wrecks everything. For what it's worth, Donald, that was such a tasteful story that you wrote on it. Uh, I mean, I know technically the right way to do it, the way other websites did it, was Mr. President Satoru Iwata dies, but I like the way you did it in that you just put Satoru Iwata, 1959 to 2015, regardless of the way the AP... Exactly. Regardless of the way the AP style book recommends, and there's there's a place for times to do it that way, I think you did the story the most tasteful, perfect way that anyone could ask for. Yeah, so, and then I started falling like a little girl. I, yeah, I, it's that was it was it felt like like someone personally close to me. It, it was we'll talk about that soon. Uh, and then I am also joined by the best dressed person in the room. Carry on, carrying on the spirit of Mr. Satoru Iwata himself, James Jones of Radio Free Nintendo. If you don't go three piece, you're not going at all. <laughs> that's that's the lessons Mr. Iwata taught me. Did you bring bananas with you? I didn't, and I don't have a leather suit like you wore in E3 2011, so I had to go with I had to go with the gray on gray. Well, I don't think any of us could ask for more. Oh, oh man, no it's bananas, it. please understand. <laughs> Please understand that I don't actually like bananas very much. Oh, uh, yeah, we, we got to go into this. So what happened was on Sunday our time, Saturday, well, on Saturday it happened, but not until our Sunday did it officially come out. Uh, Mr. President Satoru Iwata has passed away at the age of 55 due to a bile duct growth, which was part of a very rare form of cancer which at its best had about a 15% survival rate. Uh, and it was one of those things where when I saw he had died, I had the same reaction all of us did, I'm sure. The, oh no, heart dropped, uh, a little misty-eyed, it's all that stuff. But then the second thing I had in mind was, oh, like it's all the stuff from the last year and a half right. was starting to come together and like, Okay, so that's what was going on. Uh, I mean, and they had told us about the bile duct growth after he missed but, last year's E3. But do they said he had surgery? He had returned to work. We had seen him since then, although obviously much lighter. Uh, right, and yeah. bile duct growth can be any number of things until an obituary comes out for it. Right. Uh, and then it's revealed that, oh, wait, it was this very specific, very rare form of cancer that even if caught early had 15% and then when caught late only had 2 or 3%. Yeah. The, it, it seemed so similar to the passing of Steve Jobs right down to the fact that both men were the same age and they both had cancer. They had taken time off work and then both came back one more time like. Steve Jobs presented the iPad after his sabbatical, and Mr. Iwata, he went and did the in, almost the entire shareholders meeting last at the end of last month and even stood for re-election. So I don't know if it's just my interpretation of it that this came up so rapidly, whether the, growth, whether the tumor came back or not that quickly, but, yeah, just we, we find out in probably the most driest way possible when we get this press release on Nintendo's corporate website indicating that, by the way, Mr. Miyamoto and Mr. Takeda are taking over as interim directors until we can appoint a new president. It, it was yeah. very much the kind of thing that a 
company has to put out to notify if there's been a change of leadership. Um, and I, I think I want to say I saw it in Japanese originally in the text. Uh, the heading was something like notification on change of leadership on the death of the president. And you're like, wait, what? And yeah. yeah. It, it, it's it's so pro forma and dry and so incredibly antithetical to everything that he represented as sort of the company's face. Um, he you know he was very intent on sort of personalizing the executive suite. And to see it written in such, I mean, it was written in Japanese, so granted, my, my intelligibility was quite low. Um, but even seeing it written in such, you know, black on white text, or black text on white paper, it was kind of jarring. But then again, I, you know, it's a company that's got legal obligations, that's what they had to do. And, it, you know, I think it dropped probably super AM, like really early on Monday, like mm -hmm. f 5, 6 AM local time. So... You know, this this was just something that they had to get out of the way, and then they could handle more proper, um, you know, commemoration of that at a later date, which they did. Um, you know, they closed, they pretty much closed up shop Monday morning and didn't, you know, shut things down at the corporate office. Um, but you know, they did they did get to release some comments and statements, and it was. They, it still doesn't feel like a co the company's really done much publicly yet, but they're probably more concerned about being respectful to the people who actually were his family versus their public mourning. Right. I thought about this a lot, uh, and in fact, the night that we that this sort of came to a head, uh, Donald and I were talking over direct message, talking about some of the we were already preparing this episode like immediately, but we were talking about some of the stuff we couldn't talk about over text, like okay, was this actually cancer? And then the other thing we were talking about was, is there going to be a press release tomorrow from NOA or something? And Donald said, and I completely agreed at the time, 99% sure, yes, they're going to put something out official. And what happened instead was they did this very uh, toned down, uh, very respectful but also very toned down thing where they didn't release a press release, but Reggie released statements, Bill Trinan released statements, uh, Miyamoto release statements, uh, and then they like the Iwata asks page has its own little remembrance message, which I'll I'll read in a little while, and then uh, and then Nintendo went silent on social media for a day, and I think the reason why they did that wasn't just out of respect, like you're saying, James, but I also think they're a very specific company that uh, probably wants to be at least slightly careful when it comes to these kinds of things. Because whether we like it or not, uh, and I have no problem with it, Nintendo's primary audience, while everyone, is also especially children. And as a company, they, pr they might have felt some responsibility to be careful about the way they presented that message uh, because there could have been consequences to children who may have been too young for some parents to think they were ready to talk about this stuff. Well, and, and from a... And from a slightly less, um, you know, kind standpoint, they they have to be aware of the fact that they are a company, and this is the this is the lead corporate figure, and they've got responsibilities to shareholders to not do something that destroys the stock value by releasing a state. I mean, this this is really kind of PR at the edge of a razor. You know, you have to be aware of the intense emotionality of the situation, while at the same time you are dealing with a very intensely personal, emotional situation, and there's not really somebody for you to turn to for support because pretty much all of your peers are dealing with the same problem. Right. So. It's, it's, a, it's a very tricky situation, especially for a company like Nintendo. Like with Apple, at the very least, they could have went right out front with it, changed the Apple homepage to Steve Jobs, like a tribute to Steve Jobs. They, 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 we knew it was cancer and, like, big cancer, well before Steve Jobs died. We just didn't know necessarily that it was going to happen the way it did. With this, I'm very curious about the way it went down towards its final days. Like, I'm curious, did Awada know this going into, uh, did Awada know that we were, he was in his final weeks before E3? Did he know he had a year left last E3? Did he come up with the DNA stuff, the uh, NX stuff? Well, that, that could have been older, but just at the same time in the in the last year, like what happened and did that affect his decisions as president at all? And the other thing I'm going to say about that is that uh, 
Actually, no. Go ahead. I, I, yeah. I'll, I'll, it'll the, come back to me. If, if the, if the hardcore. Oh, by the way, what, what I meant. By the way, sorry to cut you off. But what I was gonna say was, <laughs> <laughs> what I was gonna say was Junichi Masuda, the current director of the Pokemon games, did release his tweet uh, or whatever, celebrating Mr. Water, paying tribute to him, and he made it sound like he saw him like a week or two ago and he seemed normal. Now, I don't know if he was just saying that just to put on a face, but I it, it made me think immediately as soon as I saw that, like, did Nintendo as a whole even know about this, or was this something he kept very private? Uh, I mean, so if you look at the pictures that have come out, you know, from, like the last Nintendo Direct, A, there's, yeah. a, lot, there's a lot less of him in it. Than there, used, than there used to be physically, you know, pictures. And B, I mean, you can you can look at him and see that he's lost a tremendous amount of weight. Um, yeah. I, I don't doubt that they were aware. I mean, because effectively, he is in a lot of ways the company. You know, he, he is he is the the vision of the company as it's currently articulated. So mm-hmm. it would be it would be self destructive to the to the vision that he articulated to his the board mints, for him to have not been prepping them for this eventuality. So he doesn't he doesn't have a vested interest in not, you know, being upfront with them. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, Matsuda's statement is that when he visited him visited him last week, which, I mean, there's there's multiple ways you can interpret just the act of what he was doing. Yes. Uh, was he visiting him in, in the hospital or was right. it at or in his home when he was convalescing? I mean, you can read into that one as much as you want. Or it's just a polite statement of like, you know, I thought for sure he was going to be okay. Yeah, but as to whether these events or whether the condition affected his, affected what Iwata did as president, I'm pretty sure that if a new president of Nintendo was to announce a mobile phone strategy, there would have been a riot. So by getting Iwata out in front of it before when he had the chance, that sort of says, yes, we're going to be doing this, but we're going to be doing this the Nintendo way, the Iwata way. And a yep. lot of that is probably the same thing with the NX. Like, sure, we they're not going to... They, I'm pretty sure we're still not going to hear anything about the NX until next year. But Iwata was the one to get out in front and say, yes, this has my name on it. So if we're going to be seeing the fruits of the seeds that Iwata planted growing over the next three years, it's probably going to be the end of the decade before we're really far away from that. So I, and then like I guess, so as we all know, uh, the last year for Nintendo as a company has been probably one of their most aggressive maybe planning phases as a business that they've had in a very long time. Uh, Or at least, it seems like they're setting a lot more seeds now and this past year than they've done for many years beforehand. And whether it comes to the partnership deals they're getting aggressive with, uh, whether it comes to the game deals that they're getting aggressive with, which started a couple years ago, whether it's down to the NX, whether which they're announcing a year early, which could have been a lot of wanting to present that maybe before. You, it's, I, I'm not going to speculate that. Uh, uh, whether uh, Amiibo. It, like planning for Amiibo. Amiibo. Like, like I mean, that's that's an intensely logistically intensive process, um, one which he actually took credit for conceptualizing uh, a few months ago, talking about he thought of it on the train. Like there's there's they are a very they are a company that is very active beneath the surface right now. For, yes, and for what it's worth, what he's done and what Nintendo's done over the last year will have ramifications for the next decade at least. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm hoping that 10 years from now, there will still be something with his name on it. I can tell you one way in which 10 years from now there will be, which is um, during during his reign as president, one of the things that he did, and, you know, they never really spent a lot of time talking about it, is that he essentially wholesale replaced the entire board of directors taking out Yamauchi family people and replacing them with his people, younger people. Um, mm-hmm. They essentially stock the board with his hand-picked, you know, people he thinks are right for the comp- to govern the company. So even going forward, the people who are going to elect his successor are people that he picked. 
people that he mm -hmm. thought were compatible with the vision he was laying out for Nintendo, people who, or people whom he had converted to that vision. So at the very least, it would take a tremendous amount of effort for anyone to come in and alter that vision because the per people who have final say in it and a final say in who they pick to execute it are his people. Right. And so at the very least... So Miyamoto's message, we'll talk about the tributes more in a little bit, but Miyamoto's message definitely reflected, reflects exactly what you're saying, and that he's saying that he and everyone at Nintendo will continue to persevere and support the vision Awada had. Uh, and I think that in a literal sense that is true, because exactly of what you're saying. Well, and to whatever extent, it's not just his vision. Mm -hmm. It's it's the company's vision. It's He's part of a greater vision, but he was also an amazing face for it. He he, to whatever degree he is responsible for that for that vision's creation, and it's very easy for us to assign all of the the accolades because he was the face of it. He is yeah. he is responsible as the chief executive for making sure that everybody was on board with that vision, and from as far as we can tell, he did. Uh, you know, there were comments by NOAs head of PR following the we re remote reveal talking about how he went to Japan and he looked at this thing and couldn't figure out what it was but it was very much the effort of you know impressing the vision upon the various elements inside the company as well as the partners that they work with that you know he was very central in and you know, that was one of the things that came out in light of this was you know his role in sort of allaying the concerns of this you know very senior person inside the American division of the company that no, this is this is really where we want to be. I know you may not see it right now, but trust us on this one. We understand what we're doing. And and you look at some of the stuff he did, uh, just as president, and just not only the way his vision or Nintendo's vision or however he nestled it was reflected on many end results, but also just how that. Uh, vision was reflected on himself and how he treated the company. Not only was he the one who helped bring the Wii to success, but he was also the one who took a huge paycheck cut when uh, a system wasn't doing well. And he was the one who got, and I think he was the one, at the very least Nintendo was, and he must have had a say in it when uh, they pretty much said, we'll do better next year uh, with E3. And yeah. I, I think... I don't think it's coincidence that Awada stayed at Nintendo as long as he did, despite that company being in some kind of moderate turmoil for the last few years, at least in a sales perspective. I think because of who he was as a person, because of how honest he was and how endearing he was and how earnest he was, uh, that made him not only a great fit for a company that is also, in many ways, earnest, Nintendo... Uh, but also made so many people see him fit to run a company. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing to point out is that he loved it. Yeah. 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 There's stories of a lot of playing pretty much every milestone build, every Nintendo internally developed game, up, up probably up to just before he passed away. And Iwata, because of his, his background as a game developer, for a company like Nintendo who relies essentially on their developers, he created an environment where they can bot, where they can have what they can do what they need to do and they can create some really great things like going from what he, from when he took over as president and brought in things like the DS and the Wii and the touch generation stuff especially to now with the success that they're having with Splatoon with this new younger group of developers who basically built this game from the ground up and something that Nintendo hadn't really done before. Mm. I don't, I don't want to go through the, the quote about his business card because that one's been really overused in the last couple days. Um, mm. So I actually want to go with, there was a, I want to say it came from an Awad Asks about Smooth Booths. But maybe it was in another interview context. They're talking about WarioWare Spoof Moves, which was the WarioWare game on Wii, um, in which he makes a cameo. They were talking about um, another motion sensitive uh, uh, WarioWare game, the WarioWare. Uh, I can't remember what they call it. Twisted? Twisted. Twisted, yeah. Where they were talking about when they were demoing the game, he's on an o he got on an office chair. When they have this little, those little toys that are in the WarioWare games, it was a record, and how fast you spun the 
the Game Boy Advance determined how fast the needle or the, the record spun and it would affect the music. And there's a story about him on the, the office chair spinning as fast as he can, smiling and telling people that this was fun. And this, he was already president of the company at this point. He's in an office chair in a development building in front of his developers, spinning in a chair, telling them how much fun this is. Like, and this is the president of a multi-billion dollar company. He, he loved his job. I mean, first and foremost. And, and that's, I think that's why people were so upset about hearing his, about his passing, because he loved his job, and he made you know that he loved his job. And there's just something so endearing about that. Uh, sure. He didn't take himself seriously. I mean, can you imagine your boss at work spinning in an office chair telling you how much fun it is? <laughs> I can't. I, uh, I mean, maybe after a few drinks, but it's like it, it was. It, it you know I heard that story. I'm like, of course he did. Of course he did that. Why wouldn't he have done that? That's exactly what he would have done. And that's you know it's there. There's something about that 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 makes. That makes hearing stuff, hearing you know, of his loss especially difficult because you think, well, who's going to be the person at Nintendo spinning in that chair now? Who's going to be the one who reminds his employees this is about having a good time? This is so, about bringing fun to people. This, it's yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I think everyone's been thinking about this a lot. Like, who can do what a lot of does, but like not be a Wada, which is like a really heartbreaking question in itself. Now, as we know, as Donald pointed out, Takeda and Miyamoto, both men in their 60s, uh, at least Miyamoto reflected not wanting to be president, are taking over in the interim, and they uh, they do not seem like choices that would make sense for this specific global president job. Now, the one I was thinking, and I think Emily Rogers pointed this out, but it makes a whole lot of sense if you're looking for someone who's uh, well-versed in fun, well-versed in the Nintendo spirit, has been around for decades uh, working with Nintendo, and has specifically experience as someone in game design who could carry on uh, Miyamoto's legacy as someone who also thinks like a game developer, Katsuya Uguchi, uh, who directed... He was the pr primary director on the original Animal Crossing. He's had a hand in every Animal Crossing since. I don't know if New Leaf is an exception, but at least... Uh, City Folk and Wild World and the original. He's at least had production stuff on. He was a designer in the original in Super Mario Three, I think. He was he had directing a hand in directing uh, Star Fox and the cancelled Star Fox Two. Uh, and he they've wheeled him out before. I think they wheeled him out for the Nintendo Land presentation. And he's he's he seems like. If they wanted, from my outside perspective, if they didn't just want to throw someone corporate in there, he seems like the next step. I mean, the tricky part, and I'm not in a position to speculate as to who they would bring in at this point because I don't know. Um, the mm -hmm. tricky part is that we talk about a lot of the developer, a lot of the programmer, um, a lot of the. I just want the gamer. The what is this needs to be fun. But when he came to Nintendo in 2000, 2000, 2000 2002. Uh, 2000 is when he first came to Nintendo. Yeah, and he was made in charge of a division there, essentially. Um, he had already been president of HAL for a long time. Um, even though he was still making games at HAL, he was its president, and he received credit for essentially pulling them out of near bankruptcy and returning them to profitability. You know, bearing in mind that HAL is still an independent company with a direct Nintendo tie versus a Nintendo subsidiary. Um, mm. So he did have executive experience, just not anything even remotely close to the scale of what he was dealing with when he moved to Nintendo. Um, kind of kind of shockingly different difference in scale, but there, there, is, there is a component of that that's going to be very difficult to replace. Yeah. I, and there are... Mm -hmm, go ahead. I was going to say, I wonder if we're going to have a situation where there's two people that have to fill the roles that he wanted to, because he was one part the boardroom, those kind of dealings. And I could see somebody like uh, Kimishima, the former CEO of Nintendo of America, possibly filling that role. But then as the public face, you know, sort of the heart of the company, that could fall to someone maybe like Satoru Shibata from NOE. I mean, 
you'll probably see if we're just talking things like Nintendo Directs, you'll probably see you know the increased use of region specific Nintendo Directs. Um, yeah. Which we've seen a lot of lately, and when they started out, that's pretty much all we saw. So they don't necessarily have to replace all the PR functions with one person. I mean, you could you could sort of diversify how you want to handle that. I mean, NOA's actually done a pretty good job of that lately. Um, Bill Trinan has yeah. stepped up in a big way in the yeah, last. They've been year. leaning on him heavily. Um, actually, Bill's in the. I watched the first few Nintendo Directs today because I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk about them as my topic. We're going to talk about. Um, yeah, we're and the first four are mm-hmm. terrible. Terrible, terrible Nintendo Directs. The first one is Reggie in a room with really poor acoustics in front of a gray wall just talking, and occasionally doing this, which <laughs> you wouldn't know that was coming later to be a water signature group, but Reggie was already hand gesturing at you to tell you about the fact that you're now going to have Hulu on 3DS. If you're on the go or at home, video for you on Wii and 3DS, which, I, I mean, Reggie, get, get out. I don't have time for this. <laughs> But um, if Bill shows up in one of those and is awful. I mean, awful, terrible, like unbelievably terrible. And I mean, they're sitting on a couch in the lobby of their building, just talking, and they're getting weird, like mid '90s MTV camera angles. You're getting like this as you're getting shots like that. It's like, what are you doing? And I think we forgot how evolved those have become and how much they've refined them. And I think everybody in the company, including Reggie, who shouldn't have needed it, has gotten a tremendous amount of media training as a result of having to produce these things on a fairly regular basis and has become much more natural on camera. I don't think that the company that was producing the Mario Kart 7 Nintendo Direct, which is akin to having nails drilled through your hand, um, would, would it be capable of producing the Treehouse Lives that we saw last year and this year? The, that, that company, the company that produced that content that we now think is really good, did not exist in 2011, 2012. So, I think from a PR standpoint, they're much better off, regardless of you know the unfortunate passing of Mr. Iwata, and that's probably a result of his, to some extent, his vision for opening the company and engaging directly with their fans. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I think on that front, they're probably okay. It's understanding what the strategy needs to be for how to utilize that stuff going forward. And, and hopefully, because I've got so much experience, the people who drive that vision now, who that was their day-to-day responsibility, don't need you know, the chief executive giving them directives. Hopefully that they've got enough ideas on their own at this point they can just execute. Yeah, and Iwata was also the CEO of Nintendo of America. Is, is yes. This the, is this the part where they, where they finally put somebody who's not from Japan in that CEO position possibly kick Reggie upstairs and let Bill sort of be more of a president role? And he'd be the COO at that point, um, which... It's, it's, it makes sense. Bill is a vice president right now, as yes. far as, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. COO, you know, the operating officer, his job is essentially to report to the CEO about what's going on. Um, you may not need both positions. In, I mean, you have the position because you have to name it, but Reggie is right there. It's The question would be if they put an American in charge of NOA, do they let NOA then have control of their own paycheck or their own you know, wallet? Can they go out and can they fund stuff? Can they secure the rights of things? Can they buy exclusive exclusives out of indie games? Or do they still have to run everything through Kyoto? Because if they do, then it doesn't matter whose name is in the CEO slot. Ultimately, everything's being run at NCL. Um, it, it's it's not just a question of who do they put there, it's who, how much authority do they have, and I think that's, to me, that's the most interesting question, and it's something that actually, of all the things that we're curious about, we'll probably see get fairly quickly handled, because I would imagine if they kick Reggie up a slot, he's been he's been at the company now for nearly 10 years, if not 10 years? Yeah, he's, it's, it'll, it'll be 12 years next, next May. Okay. I have to imagine that he's got a fairly long list of things that he would have liked to have done at this point. Um, that if he suddenly had the the purse strings with which to do it, we would see it happen fairly quickly. Um, so we may see yeah. a, a fairly quick flurry of activity if that happens. Yeah, the thing I'm thinking about is going back to did Nintendo know in advance is there a chance they already may have some of these plans in at least semi place? And then it's all—it's unexpected because they obviously didn't know exactly when it would have happened. 
but I wonder if there's a chance that they maybe had some ideas in place before. And the, the tricky thing about Awada is that what either was his title up until his death or what used to be his title was Global President. And that was a very apt title because in a lot of ways, at the very least, he tied uh, NCL and NOA together pretty tightly. Uh, not only reflecting his role as CEO, but also his appearances and Nintendo Directs. The reason why there is such an outcry or outpouring of support uh, for Awada on the American Miiverse. Right. It's that would that might have not have happened if it was mostly any other uh, yeah. Japanese. I mean, Yamauchi when he died, oh, you know, people some people posted stuff, and you know, there there was there was some degree of just like, oh, it's too bad. But a he was an old man, <laughs> yeah. pretty old man. Um, yeah. And B, he yeah, never really, right. he never really connected with the audience, and you know he was that. That's what did it ultimately. And he, he is the global president because everything runs through Kyoto and Nintendo. Um, mm -hmm. So being the president of NCL, even if you don't have the title global president, I mean everybody in Europe, Australia, <laughs> Japan, and Korea knows what's up. Like they know, they know when the call comes from Kyoto, you take it. When yeah. when a lot is not happy, which we never actually got to see, and I presume at some point it happened, um, <laughs> you had better be aware of the fact that he is displeased. Um, mm -hmm. But I think ultimately you can you can divest some power to the regional offices and, and give them the flexibility to make mistakes. But he, he was he was both the president because he what how their corporate structure is set up and also by force of personality you know how he governed what Nintendo was going to be yeah. even if you weren't getting directives from him you had to put out the games Nintendo was making and those were the games and the platforms and the design decisions that were, were expressed his vision so ultimately every region had to be Awadas because they were all executing the vision that he and his team put together. Sure. You can't go rogue and make your own games. <laughs> you can try, but they're unless, unless you want to be Howard Lincoln all over again. Yeah, and Good. then he was left to manage the Mariners. So. And then that uh, and and then suddenly he had that cult. Lincoln had that cult of personality around him with the Western developers yeah, that that Iwata had to come in and clean that up. That was a mess. Um, I, I do want to do want to mention, just it, it, it's it made I was pretty bummed out. Um, my my uh, my thoughts on Mr. Toy, his game production are well known. Yes. Um, so I, don't, I, don't I like have that. the uh, I have his farewell message, uh, which I can read in a minute. Uh, yeah, it, which is absolutely beautiful. Um, um, but yeah, I, should we talk about some of the? Oh, go ahead. We can talk about the I, tributes then. I, I was gonna say that the thing that made me laugh after I read that message because we just mentioned the Mariners was I remembered that during the Q and A he did two weeks before his passing, somebody asked him about what they're gonna do when they need to retire um, Ichiro's number from the Mariners. And I remember thinking, Are you kidding me? This is what the questions are being asked right now. Like, this is the weirdest freaking thing I've ever seen. There is no way on earth anybody asked Hiroshi Yamauchi about Ichiro's number in the middle of the Nintendo investor QA. And he answered it. <laughs> I mean, he answered it, and I was like, of course, of course. And, yeah. and, if Ninten and hey, if we know if Nintendo ever needs a lot of money really fast, they just have to put the Mariners on the open market. Sure, they can make it. You, you can make $2 billion probably. <laughs> Um, it was it was just such a like that made me laugh. And you, we can we can go into it towards comments because those are actually really biting. Like they they that one kind of stings. Um, uh, which one? Uh, Shikasato Itoi. Oh yes yes uh yeah. Well, let's go into tributes. So I just want to list some of some of the stuff that happened. So we already talked about the NOA stuff. They went silent for a day and then they t tweeted some stuff after the fact. Uh, Miiverse had an enormous outpouring. Like I've been playing. Splatoon. I just beat it, actually. And if you go into the plaza in Splatoon, 80% of the stuff you, you're going to see is in celebration and remembrance of Mr. Iwata. Uh, Chip Tanaka, now known as Chip Tanaka, did a gorgeous remix of uh, the balloon fight. Uh, 
team, which uh, Iwata programmed. It's the the weird thing. I I actually looked in the Hip Tanaka's Wikipedia page. This is totally off topic. I, it's it's it's, a, it's 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 a great page. It's a short Wikipedia page, but a, a wonderful read. Uh, apparently, Hip Tanaka changed his name to Chip Tanaka to actually distance himself from Nintendo. That, that was that was just interesting. Uh, anyways. Miiverse had an enormous outpouring. A lot of webcomic artists, like uh, Ronnie from Womp, uh, did a lot of beautiful uh, Awada uh, remembrance artwork, a lot of it featuring Balloon Fight, which was great. Uh, and then Reggie was talking about Awada challenged us to do, uh, us as in Nintendo, to do different things, new things. Miyamoto was talking about carrying on a spirit. Uh, and then there's perhaps the... not. Not the most, but the one I'm going to remember the most is Itoi, uh, more or less the Earthbound mother guy. Uh, his remembrance in a water, and I'm gonna read the thing in full because it's 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 really in something special. Um, when I'm parting with a friend, regardless of the circumstances, I find it best to just say, "See you later. We'll meet again." After all, we're friends. That's right. Nothing unusual about it. I'll see you later. You went on a trip far, far away, even though it was planned for many years from now. You wore your best outfit and said, sorry for the short notice, even though you didn't say it out loud. You always put yourself last after you'd finished helping everyone else. You were so generous as a friend that this trip might be your very first selfish act. I still can't grasp what's happened. It feels like I could still get a lighthearted email asking me out to lunch at any moment after you've made sure lunch wouldn't disrupt my schedule, of course. You can invite me out whenever you want. I'll invite you, too. So for now, let's plan on meeting again. You can call me up whenever you like, and I'll give you a call, too. I still have a lot to talk to you about, and if I come up with any particularly good ideas, I'll let you know. So let's meet again. No, I suppose we're already meeting. Right here, right now. Oh, that's, that was great. He's a professional writer. And and he he like that that is probably the most it, it probably the most uh, personal of of the comments that I've read. Um, most of them just talk about you know his role as a mentor and a friend. And that's the one where it really feels like somebody's just kind of venting. Like they're 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 in a bad they're they're kind of in an upset place and they're sort of trying to they're they're willing to just let it out there. This set him up as a very loving man, and then the image I got when I read this was uh, a lot of shonen manga, just the main character of every shonen manga, how it's like this happy-go-lucky <laughs> Japanese boy <laughs> who like is who will, is willing to do anything for his friends. He always has a big grin on his face, and he's willing to die for his friends at a moment's notice. Like I think of Hunter x Hunter specifically. Gone from that is uh, I immediately point, what I thought of when I thought of Satoru. I want to point out that we've just gone and made him Mark from Inazuma Eleven. So thanks for that. <laughs> I, I I hope he'd appreciate that. Uh, but this this really did celebrate him as a really loving, special man. That like, it's. He really does feel like one of those like like Kid Goku in a way, like how he how he has that pure heart and he can ride on the Kami Cloud. Awada like, feels like Awada feels like a grown up Kid Goku, but at the same time not a go, not adult that. Goku, <laughs> but but grown up a fifty five year old Kid Goku. <laughs> Uh, then again, this is the same guy that we talked about who, who, who while president, sat in a chair and spun around yeah. and saying he was fun. So. Well, it made the record go faster. Yeah. Problem. It was fun. But, uh... <laughs> so, 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 thank you, Mr. Goku. Uh, anyways, well, let's move on to the more fun or potentially more emotional part of know. this. And what was what was intended to be the more fun part when we actually do our tribute to Awada. So so this thing's this thing's about halfway I'm done. I'm wearing it. Uh, just uh, it's James, your tribute to Awada. Like now that we've actually talked about it, like that's that's that was com 
you were just being you. That was completely genuine, and I love it. You know, like, we, we, he, we, he deserves it. Man. Yeah, I mean, we used to have a spot on the website in the top right corner of the World Report where it was like a – we had these things called top side images. Donald was very aware of the top side images. Oh, yeah. So, but, yeah, we used to have one at the top right corner, and Ox, you probably remember that one. It was like a little rectangle, and eventually we replaced it with social media links, but it was like for events and stuff. Yeah. And for months, uh, our former editor Carly would just sit there and put up different pictures of Iwata holding invisible items in suits. <laughs> and, like, she just did it. And I just laughed about it every time it happened. But it was such, you know, it was it was something done because, just because of who he was. And, and, like, you got the sense that if he saw that, he'd think it was hilarious, too. Because there'd be ones of him doing this, doing this or doing this and holding something very small, or doing this and holding a big thing, or just holding things in one hand because he's going directly to you, or ones where he's looking like this, or the one one that she actually took in person of him at E3 in his leather suit with his, like this. Like, just, just ridiculous, awful pictures. And A, there was no limit to them. There was a limitless supply of these images to the point where... You, we could actually be worried about making sure we have the rights to the image versus something we found on Google Image Search. There were so many. And two, because this was really before the Nintendo Directs got going, so this was this was just stuff from press conferences. So once once that got rolling, if we if we were still doing that before the images went away, we would have had, we'd have been able to do them daily. It was great. And that, I mean, to me, like that that memory was what made me put the suit on because I, I remembered one in particular of him doing this and this conversation the two of us had about what was he holding that was so small in his hands. Like It was invisible, whatever it was, but it was very tiny. And that, that I was thinking about that and I was getting ready. I'm like, oh, I guess I'll put my clothes from work on. I'm like, that's good enough. And then I went, no, it's not good enough. Um, and in fact, uh, I read, we used to have Mystery Toys commentary. I read one of the interviews that he did with him and he got made, a toy made fun of him for wearing a three-piece suit. And I was like, you know what? No, I'm going to go there. I'm going to do it. Uh. Okay. So, so, so this half of the discussion is going to be talking about a water the man. Uh, this, this, what, what we just did is more like uh, a water as a president, us responding to this news story. Uh, this is going to be sort of us talking about Awada as uh, some of his history, some of the things we remember about him. This is this is the part I was looking forward to in this uh, in this Nintendo news report. So just a little background: Awada was the fourth president of Nintendo. Came in 2002, obviously until 2015. Uh, he was among several unpaid interns at Commodore Japan. Assisting the general manager with technical and software development tasks, he joined HAL as a programmer after he graduated. Helped create major games like Kirby's Dream Land. Like he's one of those guys, a lot like Hip Tanaka, who came in at the perfect time of Nintendo, and then because he came in with his talent at the time he did, ended up being a legend by 2015. Anyways, uh, 93, he was promoted to the president of HAL Labs. Uh, it became president in 2003, helped bring out the Wii, the DS, the Wii U, the 3DS. 2013, he became the CEO of Nintendo America. And that brings us into the big part of this, in which I asked James and Donald to uh, and myself to just take one aspect of Awada's life, uh, one aspect of his career, and then to just do a little research, see what you find out, and then just tell us about it. Uh, so I think this actually ties in very well with you, Donald. So go ahead. Yeah, because even even if Iwata hadn't ended up becoming president, just the things that he did as a programmer would would be enough to make him a legend in my eyes. Just because he started out with Balloon Fight. I don't know if you've seen footage of the original arcade version of Balloon Fight, but it is janky as all hell. Oh yeah, it's, it's and rough. and the NES version. I mean, say what you will about the game, but Iwata made that game even remotely playable to the point they busted it out at the World Championships this year. And they took Nintendo themselves took some of the lessons from 
what Iwata was doing with programming a balloon fight, and they put that into Super Mario Bros. So, in a way, Iwata is almost indirectly responsible for Nintendo's being a, being that level of player in the 80s. And then he, he worked on Kirby, and and then a toy come, came up to him, I think in 94, and Iwata looked at what Earthbound was, and it was a mess as far it, as... It, they couldn't do screen transitions. Yeah. Which and, is a big deal. Yeah. And so Iwata basically told the toy, okay, we can do this two ways. We can fi- we can try to fix this mess. It's going to take two years to do it. You let me rebuild this from the ground up. I can have it ready in six months. And within a month, he already had the screen transitions working, and he got Earth. He basically got Mother Two Earth out out the door in that six months. And yeah, Earthbound, my favorite game of all time. Spoilers for an upcoming feature. And. And so he, he gets a special credit in that game as co-producer when really should be guy who saved the game. Wow. And yeah, and at this point he and at this point in his career after Earthbound, he's free he is in that senior executive position at HAL, but he's still doing things like he's going into he's going in helping with the localization of Pokemon. And then he reverse engineered the Pokemon battle system to get it running on the N64 without any documentation whatsoever. The man was a genius. Like, he so, had, it's, uh, a lot of people look at Satoshi Tajiri then, and apparently it's Satoshi Tajiri, uh, Masuda, and then Satoru Iwata, basically. Right, because Iwata... Because if you've ever seen the list of glitches in Pokemon Red and Blue, it's a miracle that game boots, and I'm and I'm pretty sure Iwata had a lot to do with it. And so he, he, does, he does Pokemon, and then as he's about to take over, he's going to move into this fixer position at Nintendo, sort of a going around, making sure everything is working right as he prepared to become president. He, he came up with the idea of putting two continents in Pokemon Gold and Silver, and when Game Freak filled a GBC cartridge with just the first continent, Iwata came up with his own compression technique that they, that got the game to the point they were able to get most of Kanto into that Pokemon game. I, I may not agree with that call of putting two continents in one game because I think it gave short shrift, but just the mm-hmm. sheer technical skill it took to pull that off, yeah. Iwata's got to be one of the greatest programmers of all time, just based based on the things he was able to pull off on his own, essentially. Mm. James, you uh, this is you have some personal experience to tie to a water's personal experience, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a professional programmer, and and you know, I I heard about the things that he did individually and went, dude, like that, like <laughs> every every you know corporate level programmer in a major organization has known, you know, that guy. And that guy makes you crazy. That guy does things where you're looking at it going, what the hell did they do? And it works. And it's great. And it's amazing. And you go, how do they make that thing work? And at the same time, they're going, I don't... All right, whatever. I don't care. It works. Just just ship it. Um, and, and, you know, being that guy is the coolest in the world. Like, when you... When you briefly get to touch, you know, when your wings hold up and you get to go fly just high enough that you get to be that guy, which I've gotten to be a couple times, like, you feel like a rock star. It's the cool, because people, people give you this weird mix of, like, what the hell did you do? And, oh my gosh, how does, this is a miracle. Um, but a lot of times it's, it's just, you know, these people just have tremendous aptitude and a drive. It's 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 such a function of loving what they're doing and having the drive to really push themselves to do it. I mean, I, I'm pretty confident that you know any any skilled computer science major could come up with a compression technology to really compress down file sizes. But the drive to do it in a game that was already going to sell a trillion copies, 
um, for a company that he didn't work for. I mean, he was still at HAL at that point. You know, he was involved with some of you know the Pokemon Company setup, but he wasn't at Pokemon Company. He wasn't at Nintendo. I mean, HAL was is an independent company. He was at HAL and went over there and helped them compress down this game that was already gonna. I mean, it didn't need Kanto. Now, I, as a child, I remember going there thinking, "Oh my God, there's a whole second Kanto. This is amazing." I get to go. I get to go back to the last game. And like, there's something about that that you know that sort of, you know, that coming full 360 of when you arrive back in Pallet Town and you're basically looking to destroy that town's hero. But besides that, you know, there's just this sense of like, wow, this is this is way more game than the last one. Um, I mean, for no, there was no. It was it was purely a passion play. Like he did that because he wanted that game to be as cool as it was, even though he didn't have any vested interest in it having that stuff. And I don't know that. That game sold any more copies because you could also go to Kanto, um, but it was there well, because it made the game a little bit cooler. It's I think it, we can even go a little past that. Yes, Kanto in its final incarnation was a broken, effed up mess, but it was such a beautiful broken, effed up mess. But like just being and, there. Right, no, just being there and having it actually feel like the original game. And in my opinion, the encounter with Red, which, however, whatever hand he had in it, he is effectively one of the reasons why that happened, if not on a technical level, the main reason why that exists, is the most important moment in that entire franchise over 20 years. That is the best moment in Pokemon, is... Going up on Mount Silver and fighting Red himself. And it wouldn't be the same if you just beat the Elite Four and then could go see him. Because then it's just, oh, you've got two rivals now. You had to right. go deal with an, another entire continent to get that opportunity. Like, He's the final boss of that game. Pokemon he, had a final boss in Gold and Silver because of him. And, it, and it's all post-game. Like, the fact that you had to go clear out a whole other continent of hapless gym leaders, who at that point, you're just housing. I mean, you are... You are decimating them, mm -hmm. but you had to do it. Like that was it was, it was your your second you know, you know victory road essentially. Like yeah. that having that in there made that experience more memorable for its existence essentially. If Pokemon Silver and Gold was the uh, was just Johto, it wouldn't be half as remembered as it is now because of Kanto. And I think the real time clock plays a role in that too, sure. though, because mm -hmm. that we had never really seen that in a Pokemon game before. You know, there was it was like, oh, it's Sunday morning, I gotta get up and go do the stupid bug thing. Sure, on a technical level, that is the most important thing in that game. But from a content perspective, yeah, Kanto is why that those games are incredible to me. That's why, like, my favorite. Sure, I'll 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 go to bat for Gen three, but I think the best Pokemon games were Silver and Gold. If I had to choose like what the best ones were as like a game, I would go to bat for silver and gold. Yeah, and it's because of it's because of Kanto. I mean, I I probably wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for gold and silver, just because I nearly I nearly got a job at a strategy guide company writing FAQ because I wrote an FAQ for Pokemon Gold and Silver. Nice. So so I, I I'll definitely I'll. I, I know what my preference is, but I ha I have to respect the sheer the sheer skill that it took to actually get those two continents in such a comparatively small cartridge. Yes, yeah, sure. that is definitely something they could have easily saved with GBA, but they pulled it off on the original just, Game Boy effect. We've just not done it. I mean, it was I mean the thing sold the Game Boy Color, and that was a big deal. I mean, they didn't have to put that second continent on there. It was because I mean they knew that game was going to sell. A tremendous number of copies. I mean, you pay for the law. generation had already proven that to them. I mean, they they had somehow managed to snooker kids into buying that freaking Pokemon Yellow version. So I mean, they knew what they had. They knew the money was going to come in regardless. Yeah. Well, uh, moving on to James. Yeah. You are going to be telling us about the next era of uh, Iwata's career. Yeah. Um. Pretty much as soon as he took over the company, um, we started hearing rumblings about him talking about how we can't, we, Nintendo, I'm speaking as him, um, <laughs> you know, 
can't continue to just advance technology and appeal to a small number of people in the living room. And I think at one point he may have even used the phrase something along the lines of it's tragic that there are so many people in the family that don't play games. Um, because, you know, his quotes that he talks in, we talked about why he became a game developer. He did in an interview or in a Game Center CX for Balloon Fight, and he's talking to Arno, and Arno asks him, why did you get into games? At which point he, he wittily snaps back, wait, I thought I was supposed to be interviewing you. <laughs> um, he explains that, you know, when he, his, the first games he made were, was on this programmable calculator. And I, I, that connects me because that's what I did too, but the fun of that, you know, seeing his friends play this, this, these games that he made on his calculator, just numbers, and seeing them have fun with it was is sort of this. You know, it's sort of intoxicating. You know, he he really just lived for that. So when he said it was a tragedy that most of the house doesn't play games, it wasn't because they're not customers. He was speaking because they're not able to experience. They're not experiencing the the fun. That games can bring, and ultimately they're missing out, and that was a tragedy. Not that we're not collecting their money, also. Right. Um, so of course this led to the DS's design, um, and then when the DS was coming out, he said, "Hey, if you're looking for ideas of what we're going to do with our next console, you should look at this guy. Uh, we're going to make it ugly, flat gray. It looks like it's made by Fisher Price, um, but this this is your hint of what we're doing. But and of course that led to the Wii, which both of those things sold, made Nintendo billions of dollars. Um, very briefly made them the second most valuable company in Japan. Like, just insane. But it also led to the creation of the Touch Generation line of games, which is sort of the final statement on Iwata's vision of let's make games that engage those people who don't play games. Let's fix the real sad part about the current state of the game industry, that they're not playing games. Let's make things that appeal to everybody so they can experience that same fun. And, you know, depending on what region you are, determines what games got branded with Touch Generation and what games didn't. Roughly, you know, there's 20-something games that wore the brand. Uh, but I actually want to talk about one in particular, the, the sort of, the one that sort of set the thing, set things in motion for, for Touch Generation as a whole. And that is Brain Age. Train your brain in minutes a day. Dr. Kawashima's Brain Age, whatever you want to call it. Um, that those the two Brain Age games came out on DS combined sold 35 million copies as of 2014, which is just a stupid number for what that game is. And I remember seeing that game in the weirdest places in stores, like really bizarre. Not in the video game section, uh, you, you could find it there. Um, sometimes they would be on end caps, the toy section. Sometimes they'd be on those little those little racks that you hang on the shelves, and you have product like on a little metal rack. It's only got maybe five or six of them on there. It'd be in there in like the health food section. Just in the strangest places you would see Brain Age pop up. If you remember, the XL was originally marketed as a device for people who are older and can't see the DSi screen that well. And it came bundled with Brain Age on the game, or on the system. Um, and it had that horrible ebook that came with it that you know our friend Chiron will defend to the death. <laughs> and then um, that giant stylus that it came Oh, yeah. Oh, this, this guy. Yeah. yeah. This is it right here. Um, like there, there's just something about you know the, the vision to say we're going to make a whole brand of games that's targeting these people that deep down he legitimately was upset that they weren't experiencing the fun that games have to offer and was hugely successful in getting those games into the hands of people who don't play games. I mean, we talk about the fairly famous commercial that at least North America of Beyonce playing Rhythm Heaven on DS. And the, all the commercial was just her playing the game and laughing at it, having fun with it. That was the whole ad. And it, it so perfectly encapsulated what he meant when he said it was a shame that, you know, a tragedy that so many people in the family don't play games because that's the kind of fun that they could be having and that they should be having. That it shouldn't be, you know, just just one person in the family plays games and everybody else misses out. This is what everybody should be doing. And ultimately, in a lot of ways, his vision came to pass, you know, on smartphones. Um, that that these games got into the hands of people who just wanted to play for a few minutes at a time. And ultimately, 
this I hope is where the, what their idea is when they say they want to make smartphone games. Not that they want to make you know the dark side of the smartphone game, the stuff that we talk about and sh- get chills when we think about it. It's the hope that they're going to try to tap back into the touch generations mode. That they're going to make these games that appeal broadly to everyone. You know, they're not they're not based around complicated gameplay mechanics. They're really based around simple engagement. Um, you know, they can they can do things like I'm going to you know find some way allegedly to better you, but I mean it doesn't really matter. It just matters that their their goal is really to re-engage a lot of blue ocean, and that that's where they're going to go. And if that's what they do in their mobile in the mobile space. If that's the vision that he laid out for them in the mobile space, I have no doubt they'll be successful, because we've already seen that those that that works. That they know how to market those, that they know how to make those, and that's the market where they can really push that stuff. They could say that our home consoles and our and our portables are for those people who want to be dedicated gamers, but they can they can then turn around and go, this this is for you, person who doesn't own a video game console. This is this is. This is what meets your needs. This is what's going to make stuff for you and make you, you know, feel the joy of playing games. And hopefully, that's what would that's what will make Mr. Water happy. I, I wonder if the off TV play of the Wii U. I I use that quite a bit, but mm-hmm. I wonder if some of that, some of the reason the Wii U maybe didn't do as well is because it sort of admitted failure on trying to get more people to play games. It's like, okay, if you're going to take up the TV, you can still have your experience and let them do whatever they want. Maybe. Um, or maybe it's just, just an admission that, you know, that the, that the family is divided, that there are people in the house who play games and those who don't. And this is this is their way of making sure that you know, the people who do play games in the house still have that opportunity, even if it's not you know, on the big screen, like they like they may prefer to. I I did did want to point out some of my favorite touch generation games that don't really make any damn sense for other touch generation. But Nintendo had a thing, and they had to put them out there. They include, but are not limited to, another Code R, Journey into Lost Memories on the Wii, um, True Swing Golf for literal touch generations golf, Practice English exclamation point, which isn't really an exclamation. Personal Trainer Walking. And Nintendogs. Um, oh, I, I actually, Mr. Case Files was also one. Like they, they use the brand pretty pretty broadly, but it made sense, and it made sense when you think about it from the perspective of engaging those people that he seemed to feel very personally, um, not sad, but you know, disappointed that they aren't able to enjoy games. Sure, it, it sounded like he did everything in his power to get someone to put a video game machine in their hands, yes. be it uh, through the DS, as you were saying, or through the Wii remotes with Wii Sports. Mm-hmm. Uh, and anyway, yeah, go ahead. I was saying, that's, that's ultimately, I hope, the vision that he and his people laid out when they made this DNA partnership because mm-hmm. they could be really successful. And not just, not just from a monetary standpoint, but they could be really successful in doing what he lived his life for, which is getting people to have fun playing his games. And not just a success, but if they do it following his vision and making it the way Nintendo knows how to make games, it, it, it would be a triumph for everyone. Right. It would be a triumph for the fans as well. Perhaps the fans especially, getting the people who, maybe some of us included, have looked at smartphone games as something not for us or even <laughs> looked down upon smartphone games. Maybe this is going to bring us to video games in a new way that we might not have anticipated. As a panelist on RFN, I'm contractually obligated to play these things. And if they are total bummers, you're going to have some rough episodes. Oh, well. But we'll see. Like, I, I'm, you know I'm more positive now after researching the touch generations than I was even earlier today about what they can do. Well, you're, you're going to be doing your own research and doing your own journalism in the name of love. And, and then that is exactly what Mr. Iwata did in his Iwata Asks interviews, which oh, is what transition. I decided to do. Actually, yeah. Tra- <laughs> Mr. Iwata, making, making us as game journalists have to really step up our game. 
So, yeah, let's talk about Awata Asks. It was a series of interviews that I believe started... All, it originally started on their Japanese website, and I think the first interview, just to show how old these are, was for the Wii console. Yeah, it was like uh, 4 or 5 or something like that. Maybe US 6. Yeah, it was, uh, it was... So it's almost 10 years, which is crazy because it feels like such a modern concept, and, and it is. Uh, but they were these interviews where he would talk to developers, the actual developers who made these games, and talk to them about their processes. And he, sure, it went through a corporate filter, as it would, but they also felt more genuine than a lot of interviews conducted by journalists feel, and they also felt like like there was real information that got out on these games that even if they weren't news stories to the big populace, it was news stories to people like us who are interested in the nuts and bolts of these games, and, like, sometimes the news, like, whether they knew it or not, wasn't even all that positive. Like, some of these Awata asks have led to negative uh, feelings and reactions to games, just to show how brutally honest they were. And, and he always took this genuine amusement and love and interest with every single interview it was, no matter what it was, uh, hence the trademark Awata laugh that... Uh, I'm going to change my signature now. <laughs> that change to uh, yes to parentheses laughs there we go uh, or, and my favorite uh, everyone laughs yeah or uh, every, everyone in bold colon laughs <laughs>, <laughs> they specifically note which people laugh at Awana's jokes uh, but so I just not a lot of news came out on this. Uh, not not uh, not news, but I mean, uh, not a lot of info on its exact history came out. Though James, you have something we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I just wanted to share a couple of my favorite notes from uh, these Awata asks. And by the way, on the website now, you can read a message that says, "These installments of Awata asks remind us of our dear colleague, friend, and mentor, Mr. Satoru Iwata, upon his passing." So it's it's nice that uh, they represented a tribute to him on his his internet home. Anyways, some of my favorite notes from Satoru Iwata's Awata asks, and I have two favorite interviews. It's the Paper Mario Sticker Star one and the Splatoon one, and they are for two opposite reasons. The Paper Mario Sticker Star one was great because it revealed a lot about Mr. Miyamoto and the level of power he has as a producer, and it also revealed exactly why that game was a disaster. Uh, and it, that they, they uh, <laughs> So, okay, there were two notes that were my favorite. It was Sticker Star, where it was revealed that they were they wanted to make a follow-up to the Thousand Year Door, and they wanted to do the Paper Mario game that everyone wanted on 3DS, which you may remember from the 3DS's announcement and those prototype pictures. Like, they were making a real-ass Paper Mario game, but then Mr. Miyamoto played it and thought it was a port of the, ga of the GameCube game, so he effectively recommended that not only did they would they make it simpler and make it less of an RPG and make it different, which led to its use of stickers, though that was an intelligence systems idea, but they also he also quote unquote recommended that they only use characters from Super Mario World, uh, which basically made all partners, which the best thing of all Paper Mario games, effectively impossible. So that interview unintentionally revealed that Miyamoto completely killed the best chance we had at Paper Mario 3. Uh, and then the other thing from that interview that was great was that they revealed that the reason why Paper Mario Sticker Star doesn't have a story was because they went on Club Nintendo and they looked at the uh, responses to Super Paper Mario and they said that not even 1% said the story was interesting. But they said that the flip move for switching between the 3D and 2D dimensions was fun. <laughs> Which I thought was great because that just tells them, okay, take out the story and make sure there's a gimmick. That, that, that's what that told them for Paper Mario Sticker Star. Uh, my other favorite is Splatoon. In the Splatoon interview, which was the, their, his second to last one, where uh, he interviewed a lot of the people with Splatoon, is probably the best Awata asks I think they've ever done. Uh, because, or at least my personal favorite, because what it did was it revealed Nintendo's process for development in a more honest way than they've ever done in the past. Like, they were talking about conceptually creating Splatoon from the ground up, like how it started as this weird tofu shooting game, and they even showed character sketches at, like, Nintendo's character that led up to the Inklings, 
like the weird rabbit like uh, ink squid looking thing that was kind of messed up but kind of cool like it revealed what it was like to create a new internal character driven Nintendo property and it did it in this super smart like super genuine super earnest way which I think is super beautiful if you're going to read one uh, interview to like see how much Awada loved talking to developers about their games Read the Splatoon one. By the way, another, like, uh uh-oh, maybe they fucked this game up quote that from that interview was uh, how they revealed that Splatoon was 10% done as of E3 last year, which which, which I just thought was so funny. (laughs) And and some would say it's still not 100% done, but whatever. You know what? It's still one of my games of the year. And I'm going to actually talk about Splatoon a little later, but uh, I just thought that was like, oh, Wada, you did it again. Ugh. The uh, mm-hmm. I'll say that that one that that I really enjoy, and I don't know that it was ever officially translated into English. There, there's a translation out there. Um, Mr. Iwata and Mr. Toy, who you mentioned earlier, did one for the release of Earthbound. This is the one I was mentioning earlier. Yeah. Um, and that one is is possibly, and you can just find it. Uh, it, yeah, I think it's out there. I think they did translate it officially, but. The, the, the real fun of it is just how much of a disaster it is a- and how much you got the sense that Itoy didn't really want to be interviewed at that particular moment in time and he was really just just there to try to crack up Iwata and and at some point Iwata trying to save the whole interview because um, the poor interviewer is like, well, I'm supposed to ask you questions here and Itoy just goes, well, you already know the story so why don't you just ac- attribute the answers to me instead? <laughs> and there's just there's just this weird back and forth. You're like, okay, this 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 got strange. What what's happening right now? Like occasionally these things popped up in the Awata asks. Um, the one they did on the Wii Fit meter is kind of weird in some ways. <laughs> but like that one especially, you realize like, okay, he, a he's got a really good sense of humor. Like he was he was playing along pretty good with Toy's desire to make this poor interview his life miserable, and. B, he's really sharp. So th- there is just something about those that a lot of good information comes out of them, but a lot of times they're also just really good reads because they can be really funny. You learn a lot about uh, game development and especially Nintendo's game development process specifically through a lot of asks. Like, it's probably the most naked depiction of Nintendo that Nintendo officially offers. Uh, sure, I mean, are these it, interviews at least really, in a grander picture? Yeah, it's it's really how they were, how they tell us, you know, what they want us. It's how they they use it to lay out their vision of why they think they're different. That's ultimately what it comes down to. They look at this as their way of saying this is what makes us different from other companies. Now, whether or not it does, you know, whether or not other companies don't handle things the same way as them. Um, is, is largely irrelevant. This is what they view about themselves that makes them special. I mean, because occasionally they would do a lot of asks on things that don't make any sense. Uh, like go the vacation. Like, go vacation for a week. Like, you're like, what, what motivated you to do this? Well, they did it. And it's it's certainly a read. Um, but it really, it's... It's it's both it's a part PR and also in, in a lot of ways you know informative, which is really what you should be aiming for when you're trying to engage your customers, I suppose. I, I think I think the first one, I think the first you want to ask after his medical hiatus last year was Xenoblade Chronicles X, and I think I think that one actually might be my favorite just because of Iwata's reaction when he saw how much testing goes into a giant open world RPG like Xenoblade Chronicles X. Like he got the like apparently Mario Club bills them for the time and Iwata basically did it to doing a double take when he saw the bill. Like uh, well, I mean, yeah. Iwata's Iwata's almost lead off for that particular one. It goes in the previous game you mentioned that you had to burn bridges to develop it. This time I'd like to ask you what your priorities were developing Xenoblade Chronicles X. <laughs> like like he just straight up goes into boss mode on poor Takahashi like at the very beginning. And, and there's there's one I can't remember what game it was. Um, they, they talked about a disagreement that he he and Mr. Miyamoto did a bunch together, which was just the two of them. 
And then they would do ones where they were sort of co-interviewing a team. And there's one where they I can't remember what game it was, but he and Mr. Miyamoto were doing it solo. And there, there apparently there was some kind of disagreement between them about the game at, at some point. And it got a little um, like they were laughing about it, but you could see they were kind of replaying an argument they had already had about the state of this particular game. And it was weird, like they didn't edit that part out. Like I, I remember thinking, that's kind of kind of odd they left this in because they're not really well, they're not really saying much except kind of not sniping, but you know, yeah. Well, who was right at the end of that one? It's like, whoa, hey, and then they'd laugh about it. You're like, man, all right, sure. The beautiful thing about Awada Asks is that the interviews are connected by the president himself. So he's the one who I bet gets not he gets the final say if he wants, but I bet he's the one who says, This is what you put up. Uh, yeah. like like I'm sure the PR can or who whatever team he has can come back to him and say, Are you sure you want to include this? He's like, No, yes, please include it. Uh, this is this is I would say this website in itself is Nintendo's uh, maybe unintentional, or at this point, intentional memorial to Awada's love of games. This is where you can see for yourself how much Awada loved games. Yeah, and even uh, stuff that's not theirs. Like, even when they're interviewing, like, uh, like I said, Go Vacation, which is an Echo Bandai game. Like, yeah. he's engaged, he's asking, he's asking kind of good questions. Even when he's doing Mario and Sonic 2012, which is a terrible game. It's a terrible game. Yeah. Um, you know, they brought people in, they're talking about it, and he's he's engaged, and he doesn't he doesn't just go and like I played this game. <laughs> we were gonna have everyone say uh, kill. Yeah. Which he should have, but he didn't. So I appreciate that. I think if you wanna see <laughs> if you wanna see how much Satoru Wada loves video games, not only read the Awada asks, but as James was saying, watch the Game Center CX with oh, it's uh, amazing. Mr. Awada. It's uh, that is like you can see who Iwata really is as a person, in the sense that, like you said, he completely turns the tables on a Reno uh, plenty of times. It's it's there there is a I tweeted it out um, Sunday night, and I was really pleased to see that one got a lot of retweets, and hopefully those people were watching it and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, people need to see this. But my favorite part is he's explaining to Arno the fish how it works because the first playthrough he didn't get eaten. So he tries again on the second playthrough. Okay, well, I can go down to the water and be okay as long as I don't fall all the way in and immediately gets eaten. And he, he kind of turns around to complain about it. And Iwata just simply explains, well, the fish is always down there moving back and forth. And if, you're, if it's not where you are when you touch the water, you're lucky. If it is, you get eaten. And um, Arno kind of turns around, it, it prepare, possibly sound in disbelief, and Iwata quickly responds with, I know, I programmed it. And you're like, whoa, all right. <laughs> Like just a very quick response, and like it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, meant to be, you know, um, challenging. It was just because he, I think, he realized the tone he was saying it in was funny because he ended up laughing about it after he said it. Um, it's, it's just that's a really fun video. It's yeah, it's really fun. Yeah. Uh, excellent. So let's move on to... I'm going to actually combine these two, and we're just going to do one final go-around before closing out the show. Sure. But it's uh, two things. One, what you will remember about Satoru Iwata, and two, what you want to thank him for. And I, I suppose I'll, I'll start with you, Donald. Well, I want to thank him for basically getting me getting me to care about video games again, because I, I was just sort of in a... I was in a... I was sort of out of the industry for a couple of years, but it's a, a lot of what happened with the DS and the Wii is what brought me back to it. So uh, I'll remember him for creating some some of the greatest games that I've ever played, and I want to thank him for giving me a chance to come come back to gaming and be where I am today. Excellent, uh, James. Uh, actually, I think what I remember him for is. And I'm not sure exactly which image it will be, but it's that smile, that, that knowing smile he would give to the camera when he was being goofy. Um, the, the one the one from the, the fight with Reggie, where he, he, the camera's coming in on him and goes, like, I, I just lost it on that one. That one was so stupid. We were in the media room 
when that segment was playing, and it's just devolved into straight up aura, 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 and we're just losing it. <laughs> but then at the end, when they when they bounced off each other, and he was the, I mean, you could tell he's just trying not to laugh. Like at that point, like I was done. That like the whole rest of the Nintendo Direct was over to me. I was just losing it for the, like the whole rest of the evening. Um, yeah. But or the the really really long take with the first appearance of the bananas. Like just yes. the because that that shot goes on forever. He's holding the bananas out all the way on an outstretched arm, just looking at them for a long time, and then he sort of turns to the camera and smiles about it. Like it's the weirdest take and. It makes no sense until you understand that, A, they got the same joke that, you know, we were having on our site about him holding things that don't exist. And, B, that they were willing to play with it to talk about a Donkey Kong game. And then the bananas kept going. The bananas showed up later. And, in fact, the very last appearance he's going to do for the, the company in the form of a puppet. Um, they intro. He enters that scene, his puppet, holding bananas. <laughs> and it's, it's such a weird callback because it was so long ago that that happened. You could totally have forgotten, but, you know, they remembered that their audience is so connected with them that they could make a callback to something from a game they promoted a long time ago of him being goofy on a Nintendo Direct. Don't think it's even in a game. And, like, that smile that he cracks when he's holding the bananas just kills me. And, like, I went I probably watched that Sunday night. I probably watched that Nintendo Direct with the bananas seven or eight times, because it just makes me laugh. And I, I, that, I needed that at that moment, because that's how I want to remember him. That's how I'm going to remember him. And I think what I want to thank him for is, you know, for understanding that Nintendo's audience, Nintendo's core audience, is that engaged, that they do care. Are you saying you led by example? Yes, exactly. That the, the, Their audience cares that much, that they, you know, they watch their goofy Nintendo Directs. Even when we know going in... Oh god, it's gonna be about video on the 3DS. Just shoot me, because you know going in that you're gonna to want to watch it anyway, because you have to. Like it, it's not just because it's part of our job, although it is, but because they're gonna do something in there. We're gonna go like, ah. oh great, it's, it's Nintendo Direct about. It's a mini Nintendo Direct, so they've shrunk down Bill Trennan. Um, it's they're, they're they're talking about their plans for E3, so they're gonna have Reggie do a 80s style montage training scene. Um, you know, just just the 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 joy that he brought to it, and the understanding that they can be silly because their audience their audience loves them, and and we've we've grown accustomed to that that goofiness that permeates their games, permeating them as a whole, and. You know, they didn't do that before. You know, they would. They were a company. They wore suits. I mean, he 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 wore some damn suits. Um, they would go go out on the stage. Here's our next game. Trailer for it. Thank you. Next trailer. Bang, 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 bang. And you know how they've transformed how they talk to us as fans. Uh, you know, that's all from that same mischievous smile that I'm gonna remember him for. And <laughs> it may make our job as the press harder. Because they don't talk to us directly anymore. At least, I mean, they do. I take that back. But we don't get that exclusive info like we used to. But at the same time, as a fan, it's so much more fun that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's perfect. Um, I think uh, I think what I remember most is the way I first saw his name. Which was probably back in like 2005 or 2004 when uh, I played Animal Crossing for the first time, and I, I did the KK Slider thing on Saturday night. I saw his music, and then the credits rolled, and then the last name I saw was executive producer Satoru Iwata, and I I don't know why, but that was always the image that stuck with me. Which was, and it was by the way one of the first games. I think it was the fourth game that he actually got that credit, executive producer Satoru Iwata, on was just how his name would come at the end of every single Nintendo game I would play. Yep. Uh, and I guess the way I used to think about it was like, oh, oh, okay, big guy, uh, sure, get the last credit. Like, so, you know what, screw you. Just, just, just take yeah, you the, and Yamaguchi the final are really on top of these games. <laughs> As if you're making these yourself. But then I, I realized after a while that, uh, like, now that I've been able to reflect on that, and especially since... I just beat Splatoon, 
like literally the day after I found out he passed, sort of putting sandwiching that two games from similar development groups, uh, packaging that, which is probably going to be one of the final games he has executive producer on. Oh, Hopefully like, not, but maybe. I would imagine every game that's in development he'll be listed for. You, you can look forward to Devil's Third, that piece of garbage having his name on there. <laughs> uh, sure. So Just turn it off. Actually, just turn it off before you play it. <laughs> Look forward to a preview about that on TenderWorldReport.com. <laughs> uh, but now that I've been able to reflect on it and I've been able to see it, uh, I realize that, yes, even though he does sort of get that because he's the president, at the same time, it is his vision and it is the way he carried himself in that company that made these games possible. It's, it's his, it was his direct involvement and his love for games that made this possible. Something funny, James? You heard it here first. Devil Third is Tomonobu Itagaki's will and Awada's vision. Nah. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, it's that that's... Devil's Third excluded, I suppose. <laughs> Devil's Third can be one of those exceptions. I think Awada deserves those executive producers, at least in my heart and in my imagination, based on not having any information, because it is his vision that made that game possible. And I like to pretend that every development studio is happy to put him there because they recognize what he did, or at least now they are in retrospect. So, so I guess whenever I replay a Nintendo game and I'll see his name last, I won't feel like, uh, I won't feel like that's his ego... Yeah, old man. <laughs> but I'll feel like it was uh, it was where it belonged. It'll be a heartwarming thing. And uh, I, I suppose just to sort of bounce off what you guys did, he knew how much Nintendo fans loved him, and I want to thank him for loving us back, if that makes any sense. Uh, it's It feels like... He, I, that's it. Like, thank you for loving us back in the same way we love you, and then thank you for representing that in the way you carried yourself in your company. That's 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 what I want to thank you for, Mr. Iwata. Uh, yeah. That that's our show. Uh, thank you so much for watching. This is going to be probably the longest episode of Nintendo News Report uh, ever, and with good reason because the best Nintendo Directs, in my opinion, were always the longest ones, filled with half. 50% filler. With the dumbest so, so, stuff. So, so we're doing this in a spirit. The uh, more bananas, the better. Uh, th this was actually uh, a great talk. Um, next week, we'll do, we'll do Nintendo News Report, of course. It's, it'll be Thursday or Friday night. Just, just follow us our social media channels. Uh, James, James is on Twitter, NWR underscore James. Donald, Donald, uh, Mick... That's D-O-N-A-L-D-M-I-C-K. I'm Kalafia. Uh, just to bring us out, I'm going to change the camera so that it actually focuses on James. And James, oh, I, I would like you that. to bring us out. I would like you to bring us out in, in the way Mr. Awada would. Uh, thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. Bye.